Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be joined by Bonavista Mayor John Norman. Nestled along the rugged shores of the Atlantic Ocean, Bonavista stands as a testament to the province's maritime heritage and natural beauty. Known for its breathtaking coastal landscapes, historic sites, and vibrant community spirits, Bonavista captures the essence of Newfoundland's charm. Lighthouses dot the coastline, guiding ships and offering panoramic views of the dramatic cliffs and crashing waves in the community. The iconic Cape Bonavista Lighthouse, perched on the easternmost point of the peninsula, serves as a symbol of the town's maritime legacy. Now in Bonavista, the convergence of history, natural splendor, and warm community embraces all who venture into the captivating corner of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is Cross Border Interviews with Mayor John Norman. John, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning uh, and I want to get to know the persona behind the mayor's chair, if you don't mind. And I want to start by asking you, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, John? Uh, well, I grew up in Bonavista, and uh, I was uh, going back to the very beginning. I was adopted uh, by a family that moved into Bonavista uh, when I was a baby. And I felt, of course, they raised me, but also the town around me played a role in, in raising me and uh, creating the person that I am today. And growing up in a place like Bonavista in rural Newfoundland, going through the Cod Moratorium, affected people in different ways. Um, my family, my direct family, weren't affected. Uh, they weren't employed in the fishery, but a lot of people around us were, uh, so we were indirectly affected. And I think emotionally that has affected everybody in, in different ways. And growing up in a place like Bonavista is a very unique coastal community. Fishery has been the economy for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, you know, almost everybody is, is laid off in the area, in the town, in the region. Uh, there are no jobs. The government start just, you know, supporting everybody. People start moving away. You finish out, you know, this elementary grade and you go back the following September and three children that you knew in that class, they're, they're gone. They just disappeared. They, they moved over summer. And I, I think a, a lot of that growing up in Bonavista and seeing the brain drain, the out migration, the downsizing of business, the closing of business it made me feel that I, I wanted to be once again, proud of, of the place where I grew up. And I, personally wanted to do something about it and there were some good things happening in the community i wanted to become a, a part of that and while i was in university actually um unexpectedly a by-election occurred for a council seat uh, many years ago and i was in my uh, 20s at the time my early 20s and i came home on weekends campaigned and campaigned for three weeks and i got that seat and so began my career in municipal politics so so I, I i tried to do a little bit of research on you because i try to learn the electoral history of my guests before they come on when was that first election because the first election that i could find that had any indication of you running was in 2017 did you run prior to that uh yes yes i did <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh, go ahead yeah, uh, i was on municipal council uh before that um, I ran for re-election after that three-year term because it was a by-election, so I didn't have the full four years. And uh, I did not get re-elected the second time, so then I was off council for a four-year period. And now I've been back on council for six years, re-elected as mayor. Okay, so thank you. Thank on you and for off that. and on again. <laughs> on and off and on. Um, so... I got to ask sort of a stupid question then, because it's a unique situation that you put, you find yourself in because you get elected in a by-election, you're defeated in a subsequent election, then you run again. 
when you got defeated, did you ever think you would come back to that uh, municipal service? Or was it always something that was ingrained in you that said, you know what, it wasn't my time this election, but next time I'm going to put my name forward? Or what happened in 2017 to say, okay, John, I need to come back and I need to serve my community? <laughs> um, there, there was a strong feeling in me that the, the community needed support whether the community knew that <laughs> at the time or not. And the community needed new direction, new ideas, new energy. And again, it harkens back to my earlier comments of growing up in a rural place, growing up in a place that, like much of rural Canada, uh, one industry, single industry towns and, and communities and regions, when those industries shut down or downsize significantly, they go through trauma. And I, I have no psychology background, but I really do feel that Bonavista, like much of rural Newfoundland, from the Cod Moratorium onward, went through trauma. And a lot of people, including municipal leaders, volunteers, they did not know how to, how to deal with that. And, and a lot of communities in rural Canada do not know how to deal with out migration and brain drain and all these socioeconomic challenges that face rural communities differently than they face in uh, large urban uh, communities. And I felt based on my, my travels, my readings, my university degrees, my professional experience by that time, that I had something to offer. So I wasn't going anywhere. I had settled in Bonavista. I had already uh, started uh, what would become a, a pretty significant uh, business, a uh, group of businesses uh, in the community. And one way or another, I was going to try to turn the direction of Bonavista. How do you do that? Because that seems like a daunting task, no matter where you are, rural, <laughs> urban, small village, to a large town, to even a city. That seems like a big daunting task. Looking back on the last, since 2017, when you were first elected as mayor, your community has come a far distance since the, from the research that I've done on it. How did, you, how did you do this? And I got to ask that as a stupid question, but there are probably mayors and councillors looking at you right now going, if you can do it, what's the key to success that I can do it as well? What is the advice that you would give to a fellow mayor, fellow councillor that you say, you know what, even when things look tough, things can turn around for you? Yeah, things can be very tough and things are still tough. Uh, when you were in municipal politics, we have some uh, new councillors around the table uh, in the last couple of years in Bonavista, and they are unfortunately learning how tough it can be. And <laughs> I don't think members of the general public realize the from a, a small town, medium sized town to the largest city. You and 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 really for smaller and medium sized towns, you're most exposed. As you're elected in larger cities or provincial or federal politics, there's a certain level of insulation around you and protection, <laughs> uh, legal and otherwise. <laughs> when you're in small town politics, it can be it can be quite nasty. It can be quite difficult. I have dealt with councillors and, and staff within the town that have had a very hard time in recent years because we are a town, as you said, going through a lot of change. And sometimes, a lot of the time, humans don't like change. Whether, whether <laughs> you don't it's... say there, John. You don't say people don't like change. Come on. Everyone loves change. <laughs> well, you're going from a place where you, you had an older council uh, focused in very specific sectors. And in recent years, uh, the, councilor, the council itself has become younger the entire management team, which has greatly expanded, have become younger with specialty skills coming in. I mean, the town of Bonavista has created new management positions. We even have an ECHO, an Economic Development Culture Heritage Officer, uh, wow. created now. And these are all major inroads for a town like Bonavista. And it goes to show with our success building on the assets we had, this beautiful coastal town with over a thousand heritage buildings, provincially and municipally and nationally designated, we wanted to build on that. 
And as success grew from that, it afforded us the opportunity to expand the management of that, expand the business opportunities. And now in a town like Bonavista, I think is quite an anomaly. You have an average eight, nine, up to 11% annual increase in revenues in our municipal budget. While in recent years, we've dropped the mill rate three times. Oh, wow. There's the highest business startup rate in Newfoundland, bar none. Uh, you're, you're, you would include the capital city of St. John's in that list. Per capita, we have the highest business startup rate with dozens of new businesses opening every year. When I moved back to Bonavista a decade and a half ago, there were over 200 vacant commercial and residential buildings in the community. And now you're hard pressed to find a few. Is that challenging to balance that sort of growth with the expectations of what your residents want and need? Because when I speak to municipal councillors, not just municipal leaders, not just only in Newfoundland and Labrador, but from across Canada, there is a big nimbyism when it comes to what's going on locally at the municipal level. A thriving business sector, as you've just explained, is probably one of the best things that any municipality has going for them right now. And you seem to be doing it in a way that the the citizens of your community are comfortable with and they want to see that. So is nimbyism not a thing that you have to deal with much in uh, Bonavista? Well, based on election and re-election, and we'll see how <laughs> things go in another two years. Yeah. Um, I would think, yes, the majority of Bonavista is happy with uh, with where the community has come and, and where it's going. But there's still that minority group that will the always vocal minority. <laughs> the the very vocal minority um, sometimes, which uh, for whatever reason is not happy uh, with uh, with where things have gone. And they feel that maybe they have been left behind in uh, or left out in 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 what has developed in Bonavista, but the the facts are the facts. Revenues are up. The population has stabilized. Uh, provincial and federal governments have infused millions of dollars in ins- expansion of services and so on in the Bonavista area in recent years. Um, that's that's taken a lot of work and a lot of dedication to do that. In rural Newfoundland, three hours from the capital city and an hour and a half off of the Trans-Canada Highway at the very end of a dead-end peninsula jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean with less than 4,000 people. So it, I, I, I see positives, and I, I always try to see positives, even though my days are filled with challenges. Um, Can I but, ask a question about the uh, potential feedback that you hear? Because I can imagine that because you don't go off to St. John's to do your job as an MHA does, you don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are the local community representative. So when you make a decision around council tables, you go to the grocery store the day after, the three days after, or even the that night, and you pick up a carton of milk. Are people willing to engage with you on what's going on in Bonavista and talk about issues that are going on at council? Or is there a apathy <laughs> when it comes to municipal politics in Bonavista, would you say? <laughs> Quite the opposite. Really? Uh, you were the first oh. mayor to say that uh, the, uh, the opposite. <laughs> I am impressed with that. <laughs> uh, in Bonavista, we have some of the highest voter turnouts in the province. Uh, when I was elected the first time around as mayor, it was the highest voter turnout out of over 200 municipal elections in Newfoundland that year. Um, and for six council seats, I think we had, if remember, uh, memory serves me correct, 20 or 21 people running for six seats. Wow. Uh, there is a tremendous interest in municipal politics in Bonavista. And sometimes I wish there, there wasn't that amount of interest that I go to the grocery store and I'm cornered by five people in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but that is the reality and putting myself in a position to get elected 
I suppose I can't complain. <laughs> that is uh, that is the role I've chosen. Nobody forced me to do it. So and, and I appreciate you try to manage that. it the best you can. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, when they do approach you, is there an understanding of the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays compared to the federal government and the provincial government? No. Because I can imagine that since the pandemic, and I know we don't like talking about it on this show because it's in the past and we try to move on. But since the pandemic, I think more and more people are seeing a blurring of those jurisdictional lines. Are you seeing that in Bonavista? And how do you explain to people that it's outside the purview of the municipality because they've come talk to you. They're not talking to their MHA because sometimes it's hard to get them on their phone or even their MP because it's even harder to get them on the phone and you are so accessible to them. How, how challenging is it to not just pass the buck and say, it's not our responsibility when <laughs> every issue is a municipal issue, according to the people that you serve. Every issue. Uh, <laughs> some of the new councillors around the table make jokes and say, well, my gosh, so much rain today. That's Mayor Norman's fault <laughs> because that is the running joke. They're, they're actually quite astounded now that they ha are new to council. They've been sitting around the table for a few years and they they see it. We are apparently responsible for everything, for the sun, the moon, the stars, the weather somebody's job um, to snow clearing, to health care, to education, things that you may have some control over, things that are within the purview of a municipal politician, and some things that are well above at the provincial and national or federal levels. But they also know, I think, in, in Bonavista, that I... I do have a bit of a bat phone and uh, I I do have direct lines to people in certain offices at higher levels. So they do feel that, OK, if I am able to bring this issue forward to John, then he's going to get that to minister so and so, you know, lickety split. Oh, that's th that is also a reality and, and maybe not a reality for every mayor, but in in Newfoundland and, and in Bonavista and with the the coverage we have received in recent years, um, it puts you um, in a little bit more of an influential position uh, as, as the mayor of Bonavista. I want to turn to the town as a whole now for a second, but before I do that, I want to preface this the line of questioning by saying this for anyone who's listening, because I often get emails about this question. I don't know why, but here we are in 2024. Uh, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not even a direction of council. This is the mayor's opinion. I have to keep on saying that until the cows come home, but here we are. John, mayor. In your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the town of Bonavista as of recording this episode right now? Oh, my goodness. Choosing or issues. One. Or issues. <laughs> you, let's, let's play in as many sandboxes as you want, John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there, there are a number. Some of the big ones we have been working on are mirrored across the country. Housing shortage which was never an issue we would have dreamt of in Bonavista 10 years ago, but I had a feeling it was coming. Uh, that is, seems to be under control, or at least more under control, 24 through 25, as developers have signed on to do some pretty significant affordable housing uh, developments. Healthcare, which again, is something that we have to try to influence and work on. I've been in the media a lot when it comes to Bonavista healthcare in recent years. It is it is a major issue finding healthcare professionals uh, in all different categories, recruiting them to the community. Step one, and then retaining them, uh, which is the harder piece. Um, that is still a very challenging piece, and as I described earlier an hour and a half off the Trans-Canada Highway, three hours from the capital city. We have a pretty substantial hospital uh, for our region and other health care facilities. If they are severely understaffed, that has ramifications. Yes, directly with individuals' health that want to live in the area, but socioeconomically. 
being able to bring in families, recruit business, stabilize and grow the community. That's very difficult when people are highlighting, well, I can't get a doctor. There are no doctors. I, I, I can't get to the ER. The ER has been redirected uh, this day because we had to go on divergence because diversion because uh, there is simply no host- no doctor available to cover the emergency department. These are realities that we have faced. It has improved over the last year or so with a huge amount of work, I must say, on my part, on council's part, and lobby work with our provincial government uh, and packages that are, uh, I think, very envious uh, for other municipalities, uh, for family physicians and uh, emergency physicians coming into Bonavista. It's some of the highest compensation packages you'll find in Canada. Uh, and we've gone coast to coast looking and comparing. Uh, we have recruited a few physicians. There are still multiple vacancies to fill. And I don't think we're going to solve that issue in one year, in 2024. So I think this is going to plague me for the next two years and beyond, unfortunately, because it is a national issue. So I want to play in the healthcare box for a second, because I, like you said, you have been doing a lot of media around this issue. I know that they just, uh, the province did just go through with some upgrades to the ER in the area as well, which means that uh, doctor recruitment is a top priority for you. But let's be honest, you and I both know that healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. While municipalities can try to entice doctors, the province needs to come in and help as well. And I'm going to ask a very political question here, but I think you're ready for it because you've done a lot of interviews. Has the government come to the table to help you try and find and staff these uh, facilities, or are you finding that you're being left out on your own? And that's not trying to be like a gotcha question. It's just an honest to goodness question because a lot of municipalities across Canada are feeling the exact same weight that you're feeling right now. Oh, there's no gotcha questions with me. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good to hear. <laughs> no, we have... We have been all over the place when it comes to physician recruitment, nursing recruitment, nurse practitioner recruitment. Um, As you've referenced, there's been lots of media in recent years of me shining a light on uh, on what's going on in the Bonavista Peninsula. And out of all that, we have built a very strong working relationship with the Department of Health, with the local health authority, the provincial health authority with the Minister of Health, his office, his team, and with the Premier. I've had various uh, one-on-one meetings with either the Minister or the Premier in the last number of months over the last year or so. And it has borne some fruit. Uh, There have been physicians that have signed new contracts coming into Bonavista. As I said, there's still vacancies to be filled. But it is a national issue. I understand that we can't place all the physicians in Bonavista and leave the other umpteen municipalities in Newfoundland that have healthcare facilities and need physicians without. So I understand all that. And I think we're in a relatively good place. I think the investments that have been put into Bonavista, specifically in healthcare in the last few years, again, a lot of lobby work through our council and through our local health committee, uh, brand new multi-million dollar ER, brand new multi-million dollar wellness center. Uh, Now we're talking about uh, major renovations and improvements to our long-term care facilities, new chemo unit, new dialysis unit, new x-ray, and so on and so on, improvements to our lab. This is all very effective, I think, along with a good compensation package and flexible schedules to attract and to retain healthcare professionals. They don't want to come and work in a very outdated, poorly designed, poorly equipped health facility. So the more technology, the more up-to-date you can have the facility, uh, the more supports you can put in place, you're more likely to have success. And that's what we've seen with these investments. The investments in the infrastructure itself are married with now interest in, uh, in contracts and uh, physicians coming into Bonavista. And I lived this and I grew up with this. My father was a physician practicing in the Bonavista area for over 30 years. So I lived and breathed healthcare from about kindergarten memory onward. Onwards until t- t- January, 2024. <laughs> Look at that. Um, 
you also talked about the housing uh, shortage, and that is not just a Bonavista issue. That is a Canada-wide issue. But the the flip side of that is because most developers want to come in and build in a community that is ready for expansion. And that means infrastructure projects, that means uh, water, sewer, roads, parks, you name it, have to be sort of in place or ready to be in place prior to any development coming along. What is council and yourself doing to set up Bonavista so that way 2024, 2025 comes along and people want to start building, developers want to come in and start building in Bonavista, they can and they don't have to jump through and wait for infrastructure lines to come through and be set before they can actually start building? We've put a lot of work into this over the last couple of years, along with the new management team that we've assembled at the town hall. And we have identified available lands. We have mapped out digitally uh, with an interactive technology where the main water lines and the sewer lines are. We have personally, including some uh, members of uh, our council, driven around with potential developers showing them this land and that land and what you could do here, what you could fit there. And really taking down barriers and streamlining the process to make things happen more quickly. And I'm very happy to say it looks that we will have um, not one, but three uh, new developments starting uh, this June, uh, one of which has already broken ground with the first 15 units and uh, two others. We're still deciding how many uh, units, houses, cottages, what have you, will be placed in those spaces. Uh, But they are in the process of identifying land as well with the town hall. So I think we've made it fairly easy, fairly accessible. We have also been working um, outside of private developers. We have worked with Habitat for Humanity, for example, in recent years. And we've actually been going through the process, which has almost concluded, uh, of handing them over uh, land for a dollar within the municipality to build affordable duplexes for sale. Oh, wow. Good good on you. Now, you've talked about two very macro issues that are facing your community, but I guarantee you, if I go talk to people in Bonavista, probably if (laughs) I pick 10 people, they will give me a range of different issues. They may talk about healthcare, they may talk about housing as well, but they may talk also talk about road infrastructure, service levels, they may talk about parks, this, that, or the other. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the one? Because you, at the end of the day, understand, and your council, I'm assuming, understands that you have a very limited supply of money that you can spend every year. You have to balance each year, and you cannot run a deficit. But at the end of the day, you have to try to make sure that everyone feels like their tax dollars are being spent in an appropriate manner, that they're getting the best benefit for their tax dollars. How do you balance the community with the resident issue? Yeah. So again, you're very accessible to the residents, uh, more accessible, I would say, than the average provincial or federal politician. And unlike the provincial and federal governments, we are forced uh, to have a budget that never sees a deficit. So that is quite a challenge. We are legally not allowed to uh, to show deficit when we present our budget each year as the town of Bonavista to the provincial government and the provincial department. We have in Bonavista had some very tumultuous times. Uh, we have had in recent years and over the past decade or so demonstrations at the town hall on various issues. Uh, We have had to call police. We have removed all staff and management out of the town hall just last year for one of the more recent demonstrations, which concerned us security-wise. We have had to put in uh, a new locked door system where you can't get past the vestibule into any of the offices, which in a town the size of Bonavista, we thought we would not need ever. Uh, But you do. People can be very passionate about issues. Uh, uh, They're not coming in and threatening violence, but they can be disruptive to the workday. They are talking about infrastructure. They are going uh, above, beyond, and all around outside of healthcare and education and and these types of things. Childcare is another issue. 
They're talking about water sewer. They are talking about a new water filtration system that we are now getting a study done on, which will cost many millions of dollars. Bonavista has consciously, uh, under my leadership and under strong management leadership um, over many years now, past and present, has had a very unique budget. Uh, when we meet with the other, what are called the urban municipalities in Newfoundland, uh, the 23 largest municipalities, towns and cities in the province of which Bonavista is one. It's all relative in Newfoundland. When you're 4,000 <laughs> people, you're one of the biggest. Woo! Uh, so <laughs> we just had our conference last year in, in Bonavista, Bonavista hosted. And the urban caucus is always amazed when uh, our representative on that board tells them how our budget is structured and the percentage, which usually ranges from 15 to upwards to 20 percent of our entire municipal budget is allotted to culture, heritage, arts and recreation. And when they go through their most of them larger budgets, they don't come close it is very unique in Bonavista in, in that we heavily subsidize and support a multiple major social enterprises and not-for-profits that do heritage development, arts development. We subsidize the local year-round, 12-month-a-year movie theater, cinema, live performance venue. We, we support a lot of stuff with annual operating grants, with other supports and in other ways in order to create a place where people want to live. People have to understand that, yes, people were always living in Bonavista for hundreds of years now, but after the Cod Moratorium, there was not a great want until recently for people to come back to Bonavista, those that had grown up there like myself, and especially those that had no familial connection to the community. Why on earth would I move to Bonavista, Newfoundland? Well, now that's changed a great deal. And now we have a very diverse community with members of the LGBTQ plus community moving in, urbanites from across the country, from cities in Europe, from cities in Asia, the Middle East, the U.S., all moving into Bonavista. We're showing up in magazines, McLean's, the Globe and Mail, the Washington Post, the New York Times. How? You don't get into those publications and, and get into that circle by adequately funding your water sewer <laughs> or paving your roads. And this is a big part of what I stand for in the community, making it a unique place that will be able to sustain itself long-term. How do you do that? How do we differentiate Bonavista from the other thousands of municipalities across the country that are in rural settings that are looking for people that are looking to attract business that are looking to make a place for them in the future. And I think Bonavista has been able to effectively do that by having a very creative and unique budget compared to most municipalities. So budget for us is really big. And the way the budget is structured for me is something I have my hands on every year directly on the finance committee. So while I was doing research on you, I, I stumbled across a poster for an event that you attended in Sackville, New Brunswick, and it it explains, I'm just going to quote it here for a second, um, John Norman is the entrepreneurial young mayor being touted by the media as the Baron of Bonavista and credited with turning his small town in Newfoundland and Labrador into a mecca for millennials. Would you agree with that statement? <laughs> yes, I've been called the Pied Piper of, of Millennials. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> millennials can sometimes have a negative connotation, and I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> yes, I that I, re I remember that poster. That was part of a speaking tour. I think I did 11 talks in seven days across three Atlantic provinces uh, talking about rural economic development uh, just before the pandemic. And... So yeah, what, we've we've well, gotten a lot of attention in, in, in what we've we've what we've done. And I take pride in the fact that we can have that type of coverage and that any month of the year now you will bump into a new young person, a young couple that have moved in 
from the Yukon, from Toronto, from Vancouver, from New York, from Munich. And they read about us here or there, or they saw us in a documentary in Germany or a French uh, television show that I did a couple of years ago that was shown in France. And then they start researching and learning about Bonavista and what's happening. And what we've created is a creative community where the members of the creative class that feel disenfranchised, disconnected with the place around them or lack of place around them. I'm getting ac academic here now, but <laughs> there, there is that growing minority group that are leaving those places and they're looking for this, this place, however much it may be romanticized, where they feel connection to the landscape, to nature, to other people like them, also to energy, uh, to a positivity. And from that, I mean, our main street went from having one international exporter five or six years ago. Now we have seven wow. exporting everything uh, from seafood to artisanal salt going to Michelin star restaurants shipped out 12 months of the year. So that goes to show again what you can do and how developing a creative economy is not just tourism. That's what a lot of people, and I think some locals still don't yet understand, however many public engagements we do. It is a lot more than tourism. Most importantly, a great place to live becomes a great place to visit, not the other way around. Heritage Disneyland is over for the average international tourist. They want to go somewhere authentic, where people are living, breathing, working their lives. And that's what we have to maintain in Bonavista. It has been a working coastal town for hundreds of years. And that's what we're trying to do through our diversification now. Fishery is still majorly important, but we must diversify. And diversify that will service the local population, the 4,000 or so that are in Bonavista, the 8,000 that are in the Bonavista area in the middle of February but also the 50, 60, 80,000 visitors that we see in summer and fall. They, they too must be service, and that creates an opportunity. Sometimes people blur the lines, but I see them quite clearly. Bonavista is doing community development that is creating a tourism product by default. However much government funders wouldn't want to probably ah. hear that, that, that's how it has to be done. The, the visitor today is well-read and well-traveled, those that come to Newfoundland anyway. They are very experienced travelers, and they want authenticity. They're, they're past just going to the everyday house museum and living heritage villages. They, they want living, breathing towns, and that's what Bonavista had to be, and that is what it is. Um, you, you've taken my next segment and basically thrown it out the door here, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because as someone who will be coming through Newfoundland and Labrador early, later on this year, I've made a promise that anyone who comes on the show, I stop in and I spend my economic dollars there because I want to showcase and be part of the experience of each and every single one of the communities that have come on the show. That being said, as someone who's about to come through Bonavista and some people who are listening across Canada who are thinking, you know what, let's spend our economic dollars here in Canada and not go spend them in another country because, you know what, we need to support our local tourism industry. What are some of the tourist hotspots in Bonavista that you say, if you come here, you need to see X, Y, and Z? <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, I, I, I kind of, I'm excited for this trip because <laughs> I've only heard good things from your fellow mayors and councillors about your tourism industry. So uh, let's oh. see what the mayor of the community says about the great tourism industry in Bonavista. Well, Bonavista is a, a culture and arts hotspot. It, if you are interested in authenticity and, and heritage and history, it is quite unique. There are over a thousand heritage buildings within this community. There's no town on the island of Newfoundland outside of St. John's that comes close to having a thousand heritage buildings. We never had any great fires. We never had any huge demolition projects. So you have a very unique setting that has developed over hundreds and hundreds of years with various architectural styles and ebbs and flows of the economy. Chevrolet uh, named Bonavista a few years ago the most road trippable town in Canada and we were on their television commercial for that and we have now that emblem of uh, Chevrolet on the uh, front harbor of Bonavista 
it's a, a working fishing community, but it has become so much more. That's where it historically always was, and that still employs hundreds and hundreds of people. That's what makes it the most authentic. It is what it is. But walking through a revitalizing, not fully finished, not, not, not ready to go Main Street, but a Main Street and downtown core that is still going through a revitalization where you look to the left and you see a beautiful Victorian property refurbished as a kombuchery. And next to that, an artisanal salt manufacturer. And then you can look across the road and it's an abandoned building. Because they still exist. The, the evolution and, and reimagining of Bonavista is not complete. And to me, and to a lot of people like me, especially I find in the millennial group, not to be ageist, hopefully for everybody, <laughs> they find it very stimulating that it is a community that is alive and going through this redevelopment. Not everything is perfect in Bonavista. There are beautiful historic houses and buildings, museums, national historic sites, provincial historic sites, all can be seen. Beautiful galleries and studios of artists that have moved in from around the world, doing everything from silversmithing to salt manufacturing or coffee bean roasting. And you can walk into those spaces. And all while you're going through the town of Bonavista and through the Bonavista Peninsula and, and the many beautiful communities surrounding us, you are in a UNESCO territory one of only five UNESCO global geoparks in Canada and North America right now. And I am actually chair of the UNESCO board for the region oh. <laughs> and have been involved with UNESCO now for 15 years. And it took 13 years for us to achieve our UNESCO status for the Bonavista Peninsula. We have internationally significant Ediacaran fossil beds. We have amazing coastal geomorphology. I will diverge and, and say here, my background is earth science and geophysics <laughs> academically. <laughs> so that is, that is why I ended up on the board um, pro bono and, and supporting them. Now we have um, Dr. Um, uh, Chatterjee, who is our local geologist who has been hired to work with our UNESCO site, facilitating research in the area, facilitating visitation of unique geological heritage that is as officially designated by unesco some of the most significant in the world so whether you're interested in earth sciences marine sciences the flora the fauna the built heritage and unique man-made landscape of bonavista or just shopping on a interesting and artistic main street i think bonavista has a little bit of everything where do you go after a long day of council meetings, after <laughs> knowing that the day that you just had is going to probably happen again tomorrow? Is there a spot in Bonavista or even the area that you go and decompress at that you can just let it all go and know that tomorrow morning you're going to have to pick up and do the exact same thing over again and try to make your community better off than you did when you first woke up that morning? Home. Oh, I, <laughs> every it, single it, councillor and mayor wants to say it but only the mayor of Bonavista has the <laughs> balls to say it so there you go well, <laughs> well my home is a special home not only has it been in home and garden <laughs> but oh. it 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 is a special to me it is a building that is provincially designated it's a three-story victorian house in the middle of town, so everyone everyone sees me and drives around <laughs> by by our house. Uh, it was vacant for twenty seven years, uh, up until uh, some restoration. It was actually at one point used as a horse barn. Uh, they had chopped a hole in the side of the building, and there were horses popping out of what would have been the dining room. Oh, wow. And for about two years, uh, one of our companies uh, that I do in my private life. My, uh, my, my business and career side is heritage restoration and redevelopment. And I did it with, our own, with my own house. And now my husband and I live there. And of all the rooms in this lovely Victorian house, there is a small, cozy television room. 
And one of my great loves besides my community and saving built heritage is art. And there is important art scattered throughout our Bonavista house. And in the television room, I often sit down with the television on mute and the lights on, and I simply stare for a few minutes at whichever painting I'm, I'm thinking about that day. I'm really infatuated with two pieces that sit in that room, and one is a Quebec artist, Guido Molinari, a piece that was once uh, displayed at the National Gallery in Ottawa, is now in my television room. And opposite that is a piece by Daphne Ojig, who was one of the original what was referred to as the indigenous group of seven, uh, the lead female indigenous artist in the woodland style. And it's called The Embrace. It looks almost Picasso-esque. And uh, I'm infatuated with that painting. And I can sit there for many minutes. And no matter what stress has happened that day, I can stare at one of these paintings and feel calm. Um. I, uh, FYI, now I'm more than happy to visit Bonavista just to go visit your television room just to see those two pieces of art. So, and I'm pretty sure my husband would probably be very happy because as the former <laughs> Minister of Culture and Tourism in Alberta, he is all about the art industry. So um, I have one last question before I let you go here, John, and it's the important one because I, I feel like I've taken up a lot more time than I, uh, you probably were expecting. So I have this last question, and that is, in your opinion, what makes the town of Bonavista such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think Bonavista's niche is that it is very authentic in its in its place it is a real living breathing historic community that was purpose built for its industry and hundreds and hundreds of years later that industry is still well functioning with hundreds of people employed in that community and the harbor of bonavista is the heartbeat of the community and out from that comes everything else and if if people are looking for that simpler life but urban services to a certain degree in a rural setting then Bonavista can likely fill that niche and and that's what a lot of people have found and have been surprised by as they've come to Bonavista they visited Bonavista and they decided to relocate to Bonavista that in a town of this size in rural Newfoundland and the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, you can go to the theater. You can see an independent film. You can see opera. You could see a Hollywood film. You can have your kids in the figure skating club. I was a former competitive figure skater and a coach of the local Silver Wings figure skating club. You can be a part of the curling club, as some of our new residents have joined, or part of the running club, the biking club. You can join the new multi-million dollar YMCA that's just opened. And unlike most YMCAs that you find in Newfoundland anyway, in the Atlantic Canada, it's not in a brand new steel building coming in on the edge of town. It's in a repurposed heritage building, 80 plus years old, in the heart of a residential neighborhood. And that's what we do in Bonavista. We use the assets we have and we develop a unique community around those assets, place-based development. John, um, I am truly looking forward to visiting Bonavista later this summer. Um, and I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. It's always great to find passionate mayors like yourself who want the best for their community and are truly in a municipal government for the right reason. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this, but also thank you so much for serving your community. We need more people at council tables like you. So hopefully people listening to this will take something that you've said today and apply it to what they are doing in their own lives. So thank you so much, John. Thank you very much for having me. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. 
Stay in the loop with all of our diverse content, covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to love. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our program. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.